Our speaker this evening is Itai Frank, uh, an architect who will speak all about the Jewish architects uh, who made Britain their home after fleeing persecution in 1930s Europe. And as they made Britain their home, they also came here with, um, you know, with an influence of, of, Zion, of early Zionist ideology um, and a modernist expression in their work for these architects. Um, and now today, many of those who came are recognized today for their, for their major contributions to some of Britain's most important modernist buildings. Um, our guest speaker himself, Itai, welcome Itai, um, he specializes in analysis techniques and in methods of developing low energy design solutions. So all very, very current and environmentally aware um, issues. He's, um, his, his credentials are, are fantastic. He's taught at university level design courses and he served as guest juror at, at various universities in London. Um, he's head of Modern Methods of Construction, MMC, at a studio architects based in London. And that's where he makes use of advanced digital modeling um, and innovative design processes in the delivery of modular design schemes. Um, I was just explaining to Itai before all of you were admitted that I actually come from an architectural background too. So um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Itai. Um, and so, Without further ado, um, I would just ask again, if all of you who have your video on, could you please turn off your video and could you please mute your, your audio? Um, and so without further ado, Itai, the floor uh, or the screen is yours. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Uh, that, that, that's great. Um, Hello everyone. Um, I'll, yeah, as I think Stephen gave a quite a nice uh, introduction, but I'll um, I'll just say I mean uh, my background, my personal background is uh, I'm half British, half Israeli. Uh, my father is from Hampstead. Um, so in a way, this the, the, the story that I'm going to tell has a kind of personal side uh, as well. Um, and so it's a it's a project, a side project that I've just been interested in in the past few years that evolved from a, um, a walk that I've done with JW3 um, in um, Hampstead. Uh, and basically um, trying to, to tell this uh, our narrative of, of all these lovely designs that have uh, been um, during the 30s, a very specific time, uh, by these uh, group of, of uh, uh, Jewish immigrants. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a few today, probably the most prominent ones. Uh, but um, there are many, and uh, I think uh, in a way it's, it's, it's very interesting to try to link all their beliefs and uh, ideology into kind of one story, uh, and that's what I'm going to try uh, to do today. Um, so I will share my screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hold on. Okay, can Stephen, can you see the screen? Ooh. Hold on a second. Um, yes, we see the screen, Itai. We see, yes. Okay. So, um, okay. So, I, I guess the first question is, I mean, it, architecture can be seen as an expression of, of values. Uh, and, um, and, and if we're talking about this period of, of, of huge innovation uh, between uh, the two world wars, that in a way, um, great ideas, radical ideas were developed. Uh, many were realized. Um, and a lot of these ideas uh, found ground in um, Jewish intellectuals, um, a lot of them socialists. Um, and I guess the question was it, that I, I'm afraid to ask, but I think it is interesting to ask, I mean, is there a Jewish architecture? Is there something that we can define as a Jewish architecture? And I think in a way, there's always been uh, elements of Jewish architecture, but I've, in this specific context, um, there was a kind of Jewish ideology um, at the time that resonated very much with uh, a lot of other ideologies, i.e. modernism, uh, which I will discuss in a second. Um, and these had a lot of common ground to them. Um, in a way, um, this is a time where obviously nationalism was growing uh, and Jewish, 
identity was at a, 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 a bit of a, um, uh, um, uh, an identity crisis because a lot of the Jewish intellectuals at the time didn't see themselves as nationalists. They saw themselves as European first, and then uh, 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 um, if it were German or, or French, uh, and they tried to find new identity uh, would be global. And in a way, this is uh, one of the primal drivers of Zionism in a way to try to find a kind of national identity uh, that led to uh, the emergence of Israel. Um, now, in, in the, this gonna, I'm gonna analyze um, a lot of the buildings with two basic uh, parameters, one being material and one being spatial. So um, the language in a way of, 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 of modernism is glass, uh, which is a very um, democratic, uh, um, transparent material uses transparency. That was a, a common uh, thread um, in a lot of uh, modernist buildings. Uh, concrete obviously is can be built anywhere. It's very low cost um, and gives it a very democratic, uh, um, low level, uh, accessible to all appeal. Uh, and metal in, uh, is a material that binds everything together. Um, it can be joined. It can be modular. It can be created very quickly in industrial means. Uh, so those are all materials that were favored by uh, the modernists, not for the aesthetic value only, but also for their um, ethical value as well. Uh, the other element that I'll look at uh, buildings is a spatial. Um, and that is how people interact, what happens in the spaces between buildings, what happens in the spaces inside the buildings. And those are two uh, elements that are, are very crucial to um, understanding how the language of architecture and how it relates to their um, expression of values, as I've uh, uh, explained. Uh, okay, so first of all, what, I mean, this is almost how do we link all these different um, ideas that we're forming uh, in this time? So the first two ideas that I want to talk about are ideas that developed um, in the 19th century. One is a kind of socialist idealism uh, that was um, developing in, uh, uh, throughout Europe um, and in um, England as well. Um, and the second um, is the arts and crafts movement. Now, both of these were in the sense uh, a reaction to industri industrialization. Uh, there were many um, industrial uh, uh, segregation of the rich and the poor, which led to a lot of socialist ideas uh, such as Marxism, um, and, um, and that story is well known. Um, the arts and crafts movements, for those who don't know, uh, was a movement in the UK that was a reaction to industrialization and called for a return to nature and natural forms um, and tried to find a new aesthetic that went back to um, the crafts, the guilds, um, and tried to find uh, a reconnection with, with nature in a very uh, profound way. Now, these two ideas fed into um, one, three major streams uh, in, uh, in late 20th, 19th century and early 20th century, the first being the Garden City movement, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, the second being Zionism, uh, and the third being early modernism. Um, now, what I'll focus in this lecture is how these three ideologies actually had a common ground uh, that fed into the inter what was built in the interwar years in Britain uh, and the British Mandate of Palestine um, and immigrants that came to both of these. So in a way, many Zionists came to um, Israel and there, or at the time it was the British Mandate of Palestine, um, and many came to um, Britain. Uh, and what I'm trying to, um, in this lecture, to illustrate is the common ground that they had and the ideas that they brought um, into this um, uh, into this world. So, um, and then, in, as far as the legacy that they gave, um, the welfare state in the early years post war. Uh, welfare state in the UK and the early um, Israel under labor post 48 both had a lot of common um, ideas that I'll try to link as well um, in the course of this lecture. So uh, first of all, I just want to kind of browse through the uh, the basic ideas that uh, that went through. 
Um, so the first, the Garden City Movement, which um, is, as I said, a reaction to industrialization. The main figure in this movement was Say Ebenezer Howard, um, who wrote a very influential book, uh, The Garden Cities of Tomorrow. Um, and he looked at a way of reconnecting with antiquity, with nature, um, how once people were living and how you can reconnect to that um, idea of living within nature and having that balance with, um, with the city as well. And he created quite an interesting approach in a way that the, the precursor to uh, the modern suburb um, that uh, the satellite cities around um, with green belts around them um, that connected to a main hub uh, of the central city in the middle. Uh, now, these cities um, developed in this time, um, and he, this is quite a nice quote of his, uh, the pathway to experiment worth achieving is strewn with failure, success is for the most part built on failure. So he had tried to push this idea in the beginning, not successfully, but in the end had a profound effect on how design of cities were, um, were evolved. Um, and he tried to find that right balance between city and nature. Um, and it, the very, again, there's a very socialist approach to the way he looked at it. I mean, he saw the ind individuals of a city being part of a, of a group of trustees and participating in the decision-making process. Uh, two substantial cities that were designed in his time is Letchworth Garden City and Welwyn Garden City. Uh, you could see a lot of common, um, characteristics between the two, if it's the green belt around them, the, the non-grid um, alignment, something that's very sensitive to the local um, uh, uh, um, environment, the context. Um, it was very important for him to um, be, relate to a contextual, um, uh, 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 an identity of a city. Uh, and these two cities were, had a huge impact on other garden cities that, used to come, that came afterwards. Um, another interesting figure in the Garden City movement that I will mention later uh, is Patrick, or Sir Patrick G Gatiss. Um, and he, he was an interesting person in the sense that he was both a biologist, a researcher, an urban planner, and all of these ideas came together in one idea of biological evolution. And he saw society almost as an organism uh, that, uh, that evolved uh, through biological change. And he saw this as a, as, as a key to creating a, a healthy environment for people to live in. Um, and he saw, um, in a way, uh, the family is the, 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 the key biological unit. Um, and in a way, um, everything evolves um, from that. Uh, interestingly, he also used sociology. He used a lot of surveys. He, he tried to uh, understand what people need. And the interesting part of his approach that cities actually evolve. He asked people what, they're, what they like, what they don't like, and every, as, every part of the city that grew uh, was actually informed by um, ideas that he had uh, uh, that, or information that he gathered from uh, live surveys from the people living in that city. Um, next is labor Zionism, which um, is, I, I won't go into that too much, obviously, because I'm sure <laughs> most of you know what it is, but I think the interesting um, aspect of uh, labor Zionism is this figure, A.D. Gordon, uh, which was, in a sense, a spiritual force behind uh, labor Zionism and practical Zionism, which formed the backbone of um, all the institutions of uh, early Israel uh, and had a huge influence on uh, the way uh, uh, um, Israel was developed and as far as uh, um, the ideas that built Israel, early Israel. Um, and his approach was very similar. Um, he looked at nature as something that was lost, a kind of link that was lost with nature, and he wanted to reconnect to that link. Uh, and through physical labor and agriculture, um, one can reconnect to that uh, world. And um, again, his, he looked at organic bonds like a family, community, a nation over the mechanical bonds uh, like state and party and class, which he, he saw as something that was not organically linked to the way people uh, interact with each other. Um, and in a way, that's how he saw uh, Israel or, or Zionism. Uh, he wanted 
people to have a strong link to the earth, uh, a strong link to how they uh, interact with each other. Um, and that image of the halutz, um, which uh, pretty much created the, the, uh, the backbone of how early, the, the image of early, uh, the early Israeli, as it were, the intellectual, the works in the field, uh, that, that, that writes poetry, and all these uh, uh, ideas of this bourgeoisie uh, uh, people that came to Israel and went back to, left their, their intellectual uh, background and, and went to work the ground, the, the earth, was uh, very much influenced by um, his, his approach and his vision of how uh, this would, um, uh, how the, the, a correct way of, of living and interacting with each other. Um, okay, and this leads us to early modernism and how that, and, links to all this. So early modernism, perhaps is, you know, modernism is perceived as something maybe quite uh, 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 static and, and maybe not, you don't think of organic uh, approach when you first think about modernism, but in fact, early modernism were very much influenced by nature and how you connect with nature. Uh, a lot of Japanese architecture uh, influenced um, early uh, modernist designs. Um, this is, of course, Mies van der Rohe's Farnworth House, um, and that link with nature, that breaking of inside and outside, was key to what um, early modernism uh, 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 preached. Uh, an interesting uh, uh, illustration of this, maybe, uh, of uh, which was uh, done by Pierre Mondrian, uh, which had a huge effect on modernism and its aesthetic, is his kind of transition between, in his painting, between uh, essentially painting a tree and that gradually abstracting into a pure, uh, 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 um, almost what, not how the tree looks like, but what the tree is uh, in an abstract way. And he developed this aesthetic that was pure abstraction. But as you can see in the way, his, uh, the, 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 the gene that developed this abstraction was, was looking at nature and trying to understand uh, this um, view of how we perceive nature and how you can create an aesthetic out of it. Um, and finally, of course, Le Corbusier, who had a huge impact on modernism, uh, and he, I mean, in a way, it, he, he's, it's difficult to, he, he, he developed the idea of, a, of a architecture as a machine or living as a machine for living, um, and, but his approach of building high was, in a way, um, the mode, impetus for this was creating um, green spaces between, and is probably his most iconic building. The Villa Savoie had a strong relationship between inside and outside uh, courtyards, uh, which had a huge influence on a lot of the uh, immigrant architects that I'll discuss later. Uh, which leaves us, brings us to the Bauhaus, which probably had um, the biggest influence um, of all um, what modernist ideology is about. Um, it's probably definitely the most influential school in the 20th century, perhaps even uh, ever. Um, and just to, for those of you who don't know uh, the history of it, um, it was founded in 1919. Um, and it tried to create an ambitious, brought all the, 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 the idea of the craftsman, uh, similar to the arts and crafts movement, but just basically tried to translate the idea of the craftsman to the modern age, to the industrial age. Um, and they wanted to create a total art for a new era. Um, they moved at some point to uh, in 1925 to a building in Dessau. And the interesting thing about this building is that it pretty much brought together all the ideas that, um, that modernism is. Uh, I, uh, the use of materials, concrete, glass, metal, uh, pristine shapes, geometric shapes, a strong community, a lot of uh, spatial interactions where communal uh, activity can take place. Um, um, and in a way, he saw it as a band of fellow workers inspired by the common will. Uh, and the, it, the background of it is very socialist, uh, very uh, um, idealistic. Um, and in a way, this was seen as a mini utopia of how uh, a modern society can live. Um, at the time, the top minds were working at the Bauhaus. I mean, it was a hugely creative uh, a, a laboratory of ideas. And um, just a few of the people that worked here was Paul Klee, Kodinsky, Schemner, 
um, Maholi Naj, Albers, Russell Breuer, um, many of which Jewish, um, and, um, and all, every person brought something that was radical and different to um, this, just this, this hotbed of ideas and, and creativity uh, that they together tried to find a new language for, as they saw, a new era. Now, the interesting part of the Bauhaus was, was its pedagogical approach to how one would see nature. Um, now, uh, uh, in a way, uh, um, they saw uh, uh, um, the way you teach and the way you design as something that is intrinsic to a natural process. Uh, and they saw an equilibrium with the natural world is, is almost a metaphor to the utopian society that, society that they tried to create. So again, they tried to create a very organic uh, society that is linked to uh, organic bonds. Uh, they even at some point um, farmed uh, uh, um, peas, potatoes, lentils um, in a way to try to reconnect to uh, the, the, the earth uh, in a way very similar to uh, what A.D. Gordon was, talk, was uh, uh, writing about in his books. Um, in a way, the, the two most prominent uh, uh, ped on a pedagogical level was Paul Clay and Maholi Naji. Um, both of them wrote extensively about the relationship with nature, um, how one can uh, 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 try to understand growth, uh, and the, Maholi Naji talked a lot about the aura of nature that, uh, uh, that is expressed, um, and all of these uh, were funneled in into the preliminary design course in the Bauhaus, which is probably the most important course that defines the ideas that would come later on. Unfortunately, uh, with the rise of Nazi Germany in 1930s, um, the Bauhaus was um, closed down. Um, the, the, the ideas um, of, of the Bauhaus were very much a, in a, a polar opposite to what Nazis believed in. Um, and in fact, many of the, the staff and the students were Jewish. Um, and the Bauhaus um, building was sacked. Um, and Nazis just came in and they raised the whole building and only through international intervention, they didn't actually tear it down, luckily, and it's still standing today, but um, it was a very uh, 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 abrupt stop to uh, a very short period of time of uh, very uh, creative and uh, uh, um, innovative ideas. So many of these immigrants, um, that studied in the Bauhaus and all over Europe um, came to Britain. And these are the seven that I will talk about in this lecture. Um, as I said, there are many more, but I think these are probably the ones that had the most contribution um, to English, British modernism and, um, and world modernism for, for that matter. Uh, so the first is um, Maholi Naz, as I've kind of mentioned before, he was hugely instrumental in the Bauhaus, one of the, the, the primal forces um, of the staff. Um, and in a way, this is a nice quote of his, a new architecture on its highest plane will be called upon to remove the old conflict between organic and artificial, between open and closed, between country and city. And you can already see if he had a, this, this echoes a lot of uh, the, the arts and crafts movement, uh, the garden city movement, and Zionism, for that matter, um, in what he uh, what we preached. Um, similar to Mondrian, um, he had a series of paintings, uh, abstract paintings, in which he tried to take natural processes and try to abstract them into an aesthetic language. Um, he so he had two hats in a way. The Bauhaus one was. Uh, the, his, his work, uh, he did a lot of photography, uh, uh, film experimentation, and he was head of the preliminary design course, as I said. So in a way, he had a huge influence on, on the ideas that would be uh, developed later on uh, and, and by these uh, students that would spread the globe afterwards. Um, another influence that he had was a book that he wrote about um, um, of, of von Material Zoo architecture, um, which in a way when translated was one of the first um, English translated books of Bauhaus ideas. Um, so essentially it was the, the, one of the first um, translation of, of 
Bauhaus to any English speaking person and, and especially in England. Um, when he came to London, um, he basically had, um, was part of a, of a, a very close knit uh, circle of uh, intellectuals and artists that based themselves mainly in Hampstead. Um, and while he was there, he um, tried to find, uh, uh, his research tried to find a biological basis of space experiences, which basically means he tried to find a, a biological link between elements, as you can see here, uh, and how that can be translated into space. Um, so none of these ideas were, were, were actually realized in, in London, but he was then um, offered a quite a prestigious job um, in Chicago to, the, behind the, to found the new Bauhaus School of Design, uh, a hugely influential school uh, that had a, a, a massive effect on the city of Chicago and modernism as a whole. Um, and unfortunately, he didn't stay long in London, but um, while he was there, he, he had a huge influence on other architects, designers living in London at the time. Um, second is Marcel Boyer, another Bauhaus um, teacher that came um, to London. Uh, he was Hungarian originally, uh, and he was um, the youngest student in the Bauhaus, and quite quickly, uh, Gropius uh, saw that Gropius, who was head of the Bauhaus, saw uh, the talent um, that he had, and he appointed him as the head of the uh, carpentry shop. Um, and they held a close relationship throughout his life. Um, now, a lot of his designs at the time were hugely iconic, and they still have a, a lasting effect today. I mean, the, just the idea of using turbular steel furniture I mean, we almost take it for granted today, but um, it, it, he, he experimented with that and in the way he innovated with that use um, to something that's completely a uh, 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 common uh, furniture today. Uh, another um, design that he did was the uh, lobby of the Isacon building. Now the Isacon building was uh, an interesting place that was in a way um, uh, a, a essentially it was the first modernist building in London. Uh, it was in Hampstead and it was almost a, a magnet for uh, modernist um, designers and intellectuals that um, gravitated to it and lived there in a very communal environment. Uh, they had a communal um, uh, bar at the bottom and on the roof. Um, and many um, ex Bauhaus Tutors lived here, uh, many of which are Jewish. Um, Laz Lazarus Naji lived there, Breuer, Nam Stutsky, um, and they all created this hub um, of uh, activity in this bar that uh, Breuer designed, um, which was, if Hampstead was the hub of, of this intellectual activity, so this bar was the hub of that, <laughs> of that hub, uh, and everybody that was anybody that had an influence in this circle um, sat there and, uh, and discussed new ideas. Uh, and it was very much a, 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 um, a focal point for all these ideas to take place. Um, while he was there as well, he, he designed, he worked for the Isacon uh, Furniture Company, which owned the building as well. Um, and he designed, I mean, all these iconic um, furniture pieces that he, uh, he experimented a lot with um, timber and uh, uh, um, laminated timber. Again, you could see the influence on anything from Ikea today to, I mean, at the time, this was quite innovative approach to design, uh, but uh, that influenced him, I mean, you could see it today. Um, and these are all designs that he developed in while he was staying at the UK. Um, the next architect uh, is Lubetkin, who, in a way, different from Marcel Boren and Maholi Naj, uh, his background was different. He came from Russia. Um, and so he wasn't Bauhaus, but he was influenced. And it's interesting to see that actually he had a lot of common um, ideas with them, um, just to see how these ideas actually uh, cross fertilized each other. Um, and so he lived in Paris for a time and he was influenced very much by Le Corbusier and the constructivism. And he came to London in 1931, where he founded um, the architectural practice Tecton. Um, one of his first commissions was probably a project that some of you know, uh, is the um, penguin, um, the uh, uh, London Zoo uh, penguin uh, uh, um, 
penguin house and the gorilla house. Um, he, from quite early on, he was a huge uh, innovator in anything to do with concrete. And even today, uh, the, the pure ambition of what he did here is, is immense. Uh, he saw it as almost like a utopist uh, uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, environment for penguins where everyone is equal. Uh, unfortunately, at some point, um, uh, uh, the, the, the penguins were moved um, due to uh, certain uh, uh, um, uh, um, people were objecting to the, way, <laughs> to the way penguins are seen. But I think as far as the structure, itself uh just the, the the thickness i mean this was hugely innovative at the time and, and caused a lot of uh, uh waves throughout the world um just by the use of concrete and what it can do um his first house was also interesting in in the uk because in a way he tried to take the the standard english terrace house and translate it um through concrete to a modern aesthetic um and in a way, the, the approach here was the, 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 the challenge was that this was quite a steep site. So many of the previous, the, the surrounding houses basically had a garage at the bottom and then the, the house started at the top. And what he did is he combined the top and bottom and the, the spiral staircase goes up so that the living room is at the, um, at the first floor and, and then you just enter up through the spiral staircase. Um, and that was quite a different way of perceiving how people live um, that would basically uh, 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 characterize a lot of his designs afterwards to try to um, redefine how people live. And a lot of his houses that actually I won't talk about today were social housing. And he was incredibly influential in how in people interact within a social environment. Um, this is the inside. You can see his uh, uh, influence by Le Corbusier. Um, very uh, clean lines, um, horizontal windows, a lot of natural light, um, very clean and environment. Um, in the the uh, relationship to the outside space is very immediate, um, similar to a lot of other modernist houses. Um, which leads us also to probably his most uh, uh, prominent residential project uh, in High Point One, which I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, and this was hugely innovative for its time, mainly because of its construction techniques, uh, which used uh, modular construction uh, in a way that wasn't used before. Uh, the use of concrete, you can see in its um, very lovely uh, detailed um, uh, balconies. Uh, and it was to this day, I mean, Le Corbusier himself saw this and he said, this is a model of how middle-class living should be. Uh, and even some cited it as one of the finest middle-class housing projects in the world. And the big achievement of this project is in a way the, the, the communal and the private and the link between the two um, and something that wasn't taken for granted at the time, uh, that you either had blocks or you had uh, um, uh, a private housing. And in a way, this tried to combine the amenities of, of communal living in a, a block that is actually high rise, uh, something that's actually coming back today. Um, you can see, I mean, just this is some of the communal areas, some of the lovely uh, uh, detailing of the balconies. Uh, this is straight influenced by Le Corbusier himself. You can see that the influence from his Bill Savoie. Um, and yeah, I mean, in a way, it's, it's just a, 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 a very clean, um, in a way, a lot of unassuming maybe, but uh, at its time was hugely um, innovative. Um, and maybe today we look at it as almost something that uh, isn't so special, but that's just because it's huge influence at the time uh, affected a lot of designs that came afterwards. Um, this building had, uh, it's probably the mo his most political building and his socialist roots uh, come into play very much in this building, which is the Finsbury Health Center, which is um, uh, built by uh, Finsbury in, in, um, uh, in Finsbury in London. Um, and in a way, this combined uh, three elements, uh, the social, the political, and the aesthetic. Um, and in the social, in a way that this was uh, uh, health to all. Um, and this was 10 years before um, the NHS was founded. 
This essentially created a um, building that uh, provides healthcare for everyone um, and anyone that, can, uh, that comes in. Um, it was, Finsbury actually funded this. So politically, this was uh, funded by uh, the government, which was uh, at the time uh, a new and innovative idea. Uh, and the aesthetic was trying to create a, uh, a, a new aesthetic for this socialist beacon. I mean, you could see the materials that we use again were glass, concrete, uh, and very much uh, in tune with what he saw as, as this new language of uh, this socialist inspired um, design. Um, so, ironically, um, in, in, um, during the war, um, he was, before the war, he was very much a fringe figure. But during the war, his ideas of, of creating a fair society um, for everyone uh, resonated quite well with uh, the image that they wanted to project for the New Britain. Uh, and this project specifically was used for uh, a poster um, during the war um, that was um, basically saying, this is what we're doing for your country and uh, trying to uh, uh, galvanize the country around um, these new developments that are happening. So. Um, it was almost like an iconic building for that uh, uh, ideology. Okay, so this leads us to Goldfinger. Um, and Goldfinger is probably the most um, controversial of, <laughs> of the figures that I'm going to talk about today. I mean, his uh, designs are quite polarizing, but um, very influential nonetheless. Um, he was, again, influenced by Concrete. He, uh, another, uh, he was Hungarian as well. Uh, and like uh, Lubetkin, he um, spent time in Paris where he was um, in contact with Le Corbusier. And a lot of those ideas uh, um, seeped into his own design. Um, he married uh, uh, quite a rich uh, um, Ursula Blackwell, which was, uh, she was heiress to the Cross and Blackwell fortune. So that gave him a, a, a quite a good economic backing. Um, and in 1934, he moved to High Point um, and in a way, he was quite influenced by a lot of Lubetkin's work. And one of the biggest influences is Willow Road, um, which is uh, now today you could still go there. It's uh, owned by the National Trust. Um, and he moved there and designed it as his own home. Um, now, again, this was um, similar to Lubetkin's design. This was trying to take uh, a take on the, the, the classic British. Um, Terrace House and try to redefine it as a modernist concrete block. Um, now, he did have some uh, um, problems with planning and he did um, clad it in brick, but the actual core of the building was very much concrete. And the advantage of using concrete was um, essentially he had a, a, a central core, uh, which was used as a staircase, which held the whole building together um, so that basically only on the outside, on this core, uh, that's where the structure uh, held all the floors together. So what this gave is essentially a, a completely open plan uh, that in, can provide a, a lot of flexibility and um, a lot of freedom to uh, interior design and bring in a lot of light into the uh, design itself. Now, the core itself was um, interestingly designed with over Arab. Um, so for those of you know um, that he's probably the most well-known engineer ever, probably in the 20th century for sure, uh, that today that, that his company uh, or his namesake company uh, employs thousands of people. But this was very much one of the projects that made him famous, um, that one of his uh, first commissions. Uh, and he worked closely with Lubetkin on many commissions um, as they both shared this common passion for pushing what concrete can do and making the most of uh, its, its properties. Um, just a little anecdote uh, <laughs> uh, is that uh, Ian, uh, one Ian Fleming was the neighbor of Goldfinger and that he, they had a very uh, an interesting relationship. Ian Fleming was very much opposed to this building. Uh, and um, as apparently he, bec because of this relationship, he named his uh, villain in Goldfinger after uh, Goldfinger in, uh, <laughs> in his movie. Um, so this is just highlighting the, the drum itself. You can see how prominent it is in the design. I mean, just a lovely detailing of the spiral staircase going up, uh, the light coming through. Um, 
basically using concrete to the uh, to to its most sculptural uh, abilities uh, and uh, but both structural and sculptural um, and uh, spanning across so that there's only what you need uh, to um, uh, uh, create this uh, pure function of a staircase. Interestingly, also the facade, I mean, coming back to uh, what I discussed for, uh, before, um, the, the relationship with natural forms and natural proportions, uh, the elevation itself was based on the golden ratio, which is something that's occurred in nature uh, in spirals um, and in a lot of mathematical uh, uh, relationships in the natural world. Um, and that relationship was taken, um, you can see here, to the windows, uh, to, as he saw it, to create an aesthetic quality to this facade on the outside. Uh, this is the inside. Uh, as I said before, the inside was very open. Uh, a lot of natural light uh, uh, can come in uh, and a lot of flexibility to design uh, uh, walls that are temporary as well. Um, and he designed all the furniture. Um, everything was, uh, was a kind of total design as it were. Um, and he um, uh, tried to create a, a, a kind of to, a, a, a clear uh, path from both sides to provide natural ventilation and light. Uh, and this was all um, thanks to the innovative um, uh, structure that he developed. So uh, next is Ernest Freud, which he is the son of Sigmund Freud. Um, and a lot, um, I mean, this family is quite well known. Uh, and the interesting thing about um, Lucy, um, uh, Ernst Freud was that he's probably the, the least uh, idea, he was probably not as idealistic as the others. He was very much um, a bourgeoisie architect. Um, uh, many of his clients were his dad's um, patients. Um, but an interesting project that he did do in Hampstead is a uh, Frogner Close, uh, which you can see, it's, um, which is based around, it's almost built around a, 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 the workers' housing. It has a kind of socialist background uh, is a common courtyard, uh, a, a, a communal area, um, and it has all these um, uh, ideas that were common to other architects, but this was designed for primarily uh, uh, middle class um, bourgeoisie uh, uh, residents of Hampstead. Uh, another building that he did is in East Finchley that originally was quite um, controversial because it did it was uh, built for uh, only Jewish families, but um, they were, it, in a way, it was seen as the height of luxury for those families. Uh, and it created a, a precedent for how these blocks can be built. Um, you could see that, in a way, most of his designs don't expose the concrete. They're much more polite than the other ones, uh, which kind of um, highlights his, he was more uh, on the practical side and less on the innovative side. We're speaking of uh, innovation. Uh, Arthur Korn, uh, which was German, um, he essentially uh, wrote his big contribution was uh, is, 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 is a lot of the writing that he did uh, and the teaching that he did in, uh, in London. Um, he wrote a very influential book about glass. And when he came to London, he taught at the AA in London and he um, was part of a group that try to re-envision what London would look like uh, and, and try to redesign a master plan for London. Um, now, the interesting thing about the group that was formed called the Modern Architectural Research Group, or Mars Group, uh, that he was the chair of, uh, was their kind of approach, radical approach to redefining how people see the city. Um, their design for London was influenced a lot by um, the Garden City movement. And you can see these green strips that come in um, very, um, uh, uh, in a way, uh, 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 radical and almost non, completely uh, uh, um, non uh, uh, apl applicable because it was so so different from and so uh, uh, um, what's the word uh, unworkable in a way, uh, but it had a huge effect on the way people saw London and the green. Uh, strips uh, or the green spaces that would uh, inform later master plans as well. Um, so finally, this is the final, uh, how are we doing for time? 
Good. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, is Eric Mendelssohn was probably uh, the most, as far, as far as architectural expression is concerned, the design, he's probably the most well-known. Uh, and he pretty much epitomized the whole uh, idea of a, a traveling Jew. He, he traveled from place to place and he left his mark in every place that he went. Um, his, he was different from the others. Uh, he was a very prominent architect in Germany before he had to flee. He had a very successful practice, very uh, uh, famous practice. I mean, in the way he was the first kind of star architect, uh, as it were. Uh, one of his first designs was uh, the Einstein Tower in uh, Potsdam. Uh, and the, I mean, just the pure, uh, uh, how different and how uh, innovative and, and, and forward thinking this building is. I mean, it was just using concrete uh, to its uttermost uh, <laughs> limits. Uh, so there's no straight line in this building. Uh, everything was cast in place. Um, and this building created a lot of waves throughout the world um, and definitely put him on the map. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, he had to leave uh, with the rise of Nazism, he had to leave um, Germany. But he came to England and he left his mark here as well. Probably the most... Um, Famous of his buildings in the UK was the Delaware Pavilion in Bexhill. Um, and again, the, his use of flowing forms, um, something that uh, it, it characterizes a lot of architecture today. Uh, but he essentially, uh, 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 he was a precursor to that a uh, hundred years before. Um, and quite just elegant design and, and the use of movement in his design was very much a, a part of how people move, how people interact. Um, uh, this was a staircase. This is the outside. Uh, it was very popular, and uh, when it was built, it was almost an iconic building. Um, and its use of concrete was again uh, a, a hugely uh, uh, innovative and uh, uh, just pushing the limits of what concrete can do, um, and, and glass and, and metal as well, for that matter. Um, he built in Israel extensively as well. Um, this was while he was in London. Um, Heim Weizmann um, contacted him. He knew about his designs and he wanted him to design a house for him, uh, which became the uh, Weizmann house. Um, the interesting approach he had here is again, his sensitivity to vernacular architecture. Um, so he didn't try, he, he didn't try to force his, uh, uh, his, his language. He tried to understand the local language uh, and he used a courtyard and a lot of local elements um, for thick walls, uh, uh, smaller windows, uh, less glass uh, to adapt to the local climate uh, in a way that uh, was very uh, uh, um, successful. Uh, and this house is still uh, seen today as something uh, quite an uh, achievement. Uh, the, again, the spiral staircases, um, less use of concrete. Uh, um, uh, this was a, 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 a president's home. So, um, but you can see his signature um, moves um, are still there very much. Okay, so um, I, I just want to speak, I mean, the, the story of, of, of what the, how these ideas actually found their expression in Israel at the time, or Palestine at the time, um, the, uh, is, some, is, is a lecture in its own right. But I think it's interesting to uh, link it to, the, the, all the, these ideas, because these, this, these ideas were at the same time that this was happening in the UK. Uh, this was these ideas being realized on a massive scale uh, in the emerging or yet emerging uh, state of Israel. Um, and so, a lot of um, these ideologies that uh, that resonated with Zionism. Um, were uh, incorporated. So um, one of the most uh, prominent one was the Tel Aviv Master Plan. Uh, and for that, um, Sir Patrick Geddes was invited to uh, propose his master plan uh, in the Garden City Movement, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the vision of, of how he saw the Garden City Movement. Um, and it still remains one of the few examples of, of, a, of a Garden City city that was in, uh, basically built from scratch uh, uh, by Geddes uh, and realized um, quite successfully. Um, the interesting, what he, uh, obviously the, 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 the use of gardens, um, very sensitive to the local climate. Um, the, the, orient the, the linear orientation is meant to uh, sh um, 
work with the, the movement of the sun so that if the strong south um, facing sunlight basically is, is maximized, uh, the shadow is maximized, um, the winds from the sea are, are um, used with the ma major boulevards that bring in natural ventilation from the sea. So a lot of the local uh, um, conditions were incorporated into this design. Um, his background as a biologist was used also to create almost a, a, a typology uh, of a hierarchy between these local gardens that create a, a, a kind of cell, as it were, in the city um, that make up a larger um, environment with the larger urban centers such as Dizengoff and uh, 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 Rothschild and all these um, squares in, in the center of uh, Tel Aviv. Um, and yeah, and, these, and, and the ideas of the Garden City were very much uh, uh, prominent here. And this resonated very much with um, Zionists at the time. And they saw this as, as their uh, connection with uh, uh, the ground. Um, this was, Tel Aviv was seen as a kind of uh, 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 urban, but agricultural environment as well. Um, and you could see that here, the early um, city. And to populate these cities, these uh, blocks, uh, many immigrants came. Uh, probably one of the most prominent architect was Arya Sharon, uh, who was um, a student at the Bauhaus. Um, and on his arrival to Israel, or Palestine at the time, um, had many commissions, many, uh, and had a, uh, many public institutions, many cinemas and had a huge influence on, on the design of uh, um, modernist buildings in Israel. Um, one building that I just want to talk about is his cooperative housing in Tel Aviv. Um, and in a way, this was an expression of both the social aspect and also the material aspect of, of, of the Bauhaus um, and of Zionists in general, Zionism in general. And this was a, a communal courtyard at the time, which was very innovative because uh, the plots of Tel Aviv at the time were, um, were designed um, as individual plots. And basically what he said is, I'll take those plots and combine them into one and create one communal uh, space for everyone to uh, enjoy. Now, this was a quite radical approach uh, and to, had to redefine the master plan, but was uh, seen as a blueprint for a lot of uh, further uh, uh, communal housing that um, would be in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and everywhere in, uh, uh, in Israel under these kind of Zionist cooperative ho uh, workers housing um, complexes. You can see here the, the unit itself. Um, a lot of emphasis on yeah, how people would interact in these um, buildings. Uh, which brings us, in a way, to a full circle, because in a way, um, Aya Sharon was also the designer of the World Zionist Organization building in Tel Aviv, uh, which uh, <laughs> creates a nice uh, uh, um, ending to this. Um, but it, and in a way, you can see a lot of the influence, the use of concrete, um, the use of glass, um, in that language that he tried to develop. And obviously, um, the World Zionist Organization had uh, a lot of uh, uh, appreciation for because they uh, <laughs> used it for his uh, for this building. So um, do do we have time? What's a five two? Okay, so I, I could run quickly. I I, I thought I I just kind of show you some of the stuff that I'm working on. Uh, it won't take very long, and then we can um, potentially um, open this up to uh, some Q and A. Um, so basically, I as a, as uh, Stephen said, um, I had the um, MMC uh, department in A Studio, um, which basically what we do is we try to look at how technology meets nature. Um, that's a kind of driving element of, uh, of two things that we see today are uh, uh, um, technology being the defining element of what, how we communicate and how we uh, uh, build. And nature is something that we should uh, always connect to and always remember. Um, and so, MMC, which officially is a modern methods of construction, basically encapsulates everything that uh, is um, new and modern. And, and it's ma mainly used in the context of modular housing uh, and how we can develop new aesthetics for how modular housing can be built. Uh, this is a scheme for um, modular housing for temporary accommodation in Desborough Road in uh, Wickham. 
Um, and in the way, uh, the population is quite vulnerable. Uh, and we thought of how to reconnect a sense of community for these people uh, and have them uh, uh, connect with each other and have a, 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 a lot of work was done on the landscape and how we can create quite a pleasant uh, communal area for all of them to, um, at the brief time that they are there, they can uh, uh, interact with each other and perhaps uh, uh, heal. Uh, another project is an Olympic legacy project um, in Eastern Can Sweetwater. Um, again, um, big emphasis um, on, on public realm and how people uh, interact. Uh, this is another modular scheme and we developed some um, interesting digital tools to assess uh, uh, solar analysis to have these units as um, ecologically uh, viable as possible, uh, but also um, adapt to uh, specific um, constraints of the London housing plan and, uh, and essentially how um, modular fabrication can be realized. Um, this is another, pro the way we work is we always analyze uh, the solar analysis. We, this is a, a, a project that we use what's called the genetic algorithm to uh, create performance criteria. I always use like a, a biological process to analyze different uh, 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 options uh, using different parameters that we defined before. If it's uh, views, uh, connectivity with the, uh, or, or solar analysis and try to find solutions that best uh, uh, um, address all those performance criteria. Um, and in a way that's using the, the, the uh, 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 computer to not design for us, but um, essentially help us understand or make us better designers and make better decisions uh, and find better spaces um, for uh, these residential uh, environments. So, okay, so if you have any uh, questions, um, you can... Hey, well, Itai, that, um, that was fascinating. Um, for me, you know, with my background in architecture, it was absolutely fascinating and I hope that everyone who's still with us has found it equally so. Um, we've had a few questions come through on the chat, so I shall um, I shall start asking them now as I go through them. Just bear with me. Um, so one question from Lucille Cohen: um, Was there any was there ever any overlap between the Art Deco and the Bauhaus influence in Britain from these refugee architects? Um, yes, there was. I mean, I think one example is what I gave uh, Ernst for it is probably the most um, obvious uh, overlap. Uh, and the way Art Deco was a, a precursor to modernism in, uh, in, in the UK. So before, before modernism arrived, uh, Art Deco was, was something that was already there. And a lot of the um, buildings, the designs were already there to begin with. Uh, Art Deco was less... Um, uh, it had a less ideological approach. It was more um, uh, 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 a bourgeoisie kind of uh, uh, the, the design, but a lot of the common languages, uh, if there's use of concrete, uh, the, the, the forms, the clean forms, I mean, they, there's definitely an overlap between the two. But they, they, Art Deco came from a different um, background in a way. Sure, okay. Um, so a gentleman here by the name of David Grossman has asked, you, you've mentioned links with nature in terms yes. of the, this modernist architecture, um, this modernist ideology, but no use, but you haven't mentioned use of structural timber, for example, fra you know, structural fra timber frame, ceiling, um, ceiling members. Um, is, there, is there any reason, has it, you know, to what degree have those, have those materials, you know, been, been present or part of the, the modernist? ideology? Um, I think, I mean, I, I, there was mostly for furniture. Um, uh, structural timber has come into uh, uh, the, the main, uh, uh, the, the, the discussion quite late. Uh, I, I think someone said that uh, if concrete is the material of the 20th century, structural timber is the material of the 21st century. Um, and uh, I think, was, um, and the, I think the, the, the early modernists they didn't see that they 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 mainly focused on concrete glass and um uh and and, and steel um in most of their designs uh the it, it was i think later the the later waves of modernists used timber much more if it was alvar alto obviously 
Um, and um, there was, I mean, it's almost like a different stream, but um, it wasn't the mainstream of, of modernism, um, right. but it definitely was there. Yeah, but I don't have anything. Uh, I think it, it came into prominence much more. I think more of the Scandinavian designs were, were using timber much more, um, but none of those, I, th I don't recall uh, that having a big influence in, in, in the immigrants coming to the UK. Right, okay, thank you. Um, another question from Kay Bagon. Um, why did the Nazis close down the Bauhaus when Gropius wasn't even Jewish? Is there any reason? Well, as I say, yeah, so um, a lot of the uh, ideology of the Bauhaus, um, the abstract, it was seen as, uh, as the Nazis call it, uh, degenerate art. Uh, they, they saw it as a, a kind of socialist, uh, uh, abstract, uh, all the things that Nazis were, <laughs> were very much opposed to. Yeah. So uh, on an ideological level, um, they saw that as, 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 as something of a corrupting influence uh, to what they believed in. Uh, so they saw that as a big danger to, to what they, 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 they saw. And, um, and, and the way that whole intellectual approach of the Bauhaus, I mean, all these things were... Um, yeah, something that didn't fit well with the Nazi party in general. Um, so I think in, in a way, it's, it's interesting that they did sit well with a lot of uh, Jewish uh, ideas. Um, so in a way, that link is quite interesting uh, to make. But um, it definitely didn't yeah, work with uh, what they saw as, as, as art. I mean, I think they, they, they held a lot of um, exhibitions, uh, what um, degenerate art is, and a lot of the Bauhaus artists <laughs> featured in those exhibitions of what is not allowed to do. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that, that was definitely a, a driving element there. Okay. And we have a, a very interesting question here from um, Barbara Christian, um, saying that she'd be very interested to know if you have um, come across any female architects contributing to the British modernist architecture ah. and or early Israeli architecture. Yes, I mean, there is, um, um, the, um, uh, the, she designed the interior of the, um, uh, of the um, museum, the Israel Museum, uh, Doa Gad is her name. Right. Uh, and she, yeah, she was very influ influential in uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, and Gerstein as well. I mean, yeah, there, there were quite a few in Israel. Um, I, um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, it is an interesting question. I think, um, it, it, you know, at the time, obviously, uh, there, were, there were many um, female students at the Bauhaus and they uh, clearly uh, 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 had a huge effect on, on, on architecture in the world. Um, but, um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's a good point. I, I should probably uh, uh, include a few next next lecture. Right. Um, we we know. I'm, I'm assuming most most people in this webinar are very aware that in Tel Aviv, UNESCO have um, bestowed it. The, you know, a UNESCO status, uh, the White City, recognizing its abundance of Bauhaus um, architecture. Um, to what degree has England bestowed any sort of specific status on some of the bit on some or any of the buildings that you've mentioned this evening um or, or that you know other buildings by the by the architects that you've mentioned this evening i, I seem to recall you mentioning one of goldfinger's buildings that has yeah. um, english heritage or national heritage status yeah english um, heritage are, yeah right are there any others that you're you're aware of that have um status? yeah i mean i think um well yeah it's interesting that, that that unesco has i mean tel aviv is is, is a huge i mean that, that that's a world heritage heritage site now um uh, because it has the most Bauhaus buildings anywhere in the world um so um many of the buildings that i did discuss are grade two star um i don't think any one of the grade ones uh um but um they are listed. Many of them are listed. Most of them are listed. Some of them are unfortunately not. But um, I think the, the, the Bexwell, uh, the Delaware Pavilion, that's great two stars. So there is some recognition. Uh, Goldfinger's, um, yeah, Willow Road, but also uh, other more controversial buildings have a listing. So um, there, is, there is recognition for them. Right. Uh, there's no overall encompassing, like in 
Tel Aviv. Uh, oh. I think basically because it's um, not there's not one area that can can you can categorize as as um, something worth um, protecting. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Well, we've I think we've come to the end of of the questions from from people in the chat. Um, just one more that I have, and it's you know again going back to my background in architecture, but. Bearing in mind I was studying, I started to study almost, um, well, you know, just over 30 years ago. Um, to what degree, um, to what degree does modernist architecture nowadays, what, what, what influence or, or presence does that have in, in modern architectural training in the different architectural institutions throughout the country? What, what modernism? Yes. Yeah. Um... Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I think the whole idea of, of 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 a process to design. I mean, I guess every institution has its own uh, uh, ideology, uh, but the idea that the, especially in the Bauhaus, uh, that the design is shouldn't be seen as. Uh, I think the big, uh, accomplishment that the Bauhaus did that uh, what was seen before. I mean, has the Beaux Arts uh, School of Design and uh, the Cole Polytechnique. Uh, that the, there was either something that seen you saw elevations as something that you draw, mm -hmm. you had a structure uh, which was what the engineers did, uh, and what the Bauhaus did is they combined the two together and said a building needs to be both structural and uh, as a craft and also something that uh, is not only a, a two-dimensional kind of picture an elevation but a process of of a design that you develop. Uh, we saw it as almost an organic process. Um, and that's a huge contribution because um, I think all, any school that you go to today um, will have that kind of process in place. Yeah. Uh, it's not only about just drawing a pretty elevation and it's not only about uh, uh, um, uh, even analyzing a structure. It's, it's about combining all these elements and, and creating a, a, a narrative and, and an interesting um, uh, uh, um, journey. Um, in in a, in a design, um, and that is something that I think is common to any any school today. So I think that's that that's a huge contribution because I mean you look at the 19th century schools. I mean they were completely classicist, uh, very uh, uh, static, and dynamicism that the Bauhaus brought um, I mean, is something that, that that yeah has really had a huge effect. Fantastic. Okay, well, it's, it's been a pleasure, an absolute pleasure having you join us tonight. It's been fascinating, a very fascinating insight. Um, to all of you who are, are still with us, um, you know, we've been the ZF. I'm Steve Winston, the interim um, director at the ZF. Uh, we've been doing this in partnership with the World Zionist Organization here in the UK. And um, we have another very interesting um webinar on the 2nd of um august which is all about is it annexation or isn't it so it's a very um political politically driven um uh or politically focused webinar so please do watch out on both the wzo and the zf uh, facebook pages and twitter accounts um and thanks again for joining us it's i it's been a pleasure as i've said Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. And um, we look forward to you know speaking with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Let's go out. Clear trot.